There we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Fraud Prevention Roundtable. My name is Alexander Hall, and with me today are Sandeep from AuthSafe and Mr. Sean Culpitz from Just Eat Takeaway. Uh, in a minute here, I'm going to open up the floor for them to introduce themselves and share a little bit of their experience with you. Um, but before that, I want to mention that today's session is all about ATOs and how you can leverage session data to defend against them in your operation. So with that, Sandeep, Sean, go ahead. Hey, thanks, Alex. I think it's it's been a great. I'm glad to be part of this roundtable discussion. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, or maybe good evening, uh, whoever is joining from around the globe. I am Sandeep Kamle. I'm coming from a cybersecurity professional, almost, a, I would say, 10 years, been doing cybersecurity. Now, recently, uh, I'm being a part of OTSIF as a product manager, where we are trying to fight with frauds, build new function engine where we will be able to identify the frauds and help a lot of users to, to get fraud. Uh, this is what about me. And I think, uh, uh, Sean, I think you can take it further. Hey everybody, pleased to virtually meet you all. Thanks to Alex and Sandeep for having me in here. I'm Sean, Senior Fraud Investigator for JustEatTakeaway.com. I work in the Global Fraud Operations Team. We look after all the different account frauds that are going on on the platform for all the different stakeholders, be them customers, couriers, employees, restaurants. Um, I've been in the field now for about four years fighting fraud per se. Uh, prior to that, I worked some physical security and loss prevention. And prior to that, it was accounting. So kind of bred into this whole role from right from the beginning. Awesome. Uh, so for everybody in attendance, I want to lay down some house rules or some encouragement to engage is really what it is. Uh, the housekeeping items are as follows. Please engage as much as you'd like, even if it's not relevant directly to the topic at hand. Uh, we encourage you to bring any thoughts, challenges, solutions up in the chat and we'll, we'll fold them into the, uh, we'll fold it into the content. This is intended to be a round table for everybody to engage and get their questions and answers, uh, across the table. That's one. Uh, two is we've opened up our schedule. You can expect to see more of this content twice a month instead of once a month. This is the first month where we're doing two, uh, in one month. Um, yeah, with that, uh, I'm going to invite Sean to go ahead and set the landscape for us. Let us know why ATOs have become such a big deal. Uh, the kind of damage that they're doing out in the world, uh, and, and really help to, uh, uh, illustrate what corners of the marketplace ATOs are affecting and how they're affecting it. So Sean, go right ahead. Yeah, ATOs are really prevalent right now. Um, as everyone's aware, just looking through the news, there's data breaches all over the place. Not only do you have to worry about your data breaches, though, there's a lot of, of the ishing schemes that are going on, be them phishing, smishing, vishing, kishing, whatever. Um, put a letter before ish, and that's what they're doing. Um, and there, there's a lot of it, and unfortunately, people fall for it. Um, and with that, there's also the concern that People use the same email password combinations all the time um, on multiple different platforms. So you get access to one, you have access to them all. Another big uh, reason why ATOs are coming into prevalence right now uh, outside of their ease is just simply GDPR uh, rules and regulations coming into play. Um, it's much easier to use an, an account that has credentials and everything saved to it already than it is to build one from the beginning. Um, and we're seeing it all, all over the global landscape. It's not just on your e-commerce marketplaces. You're seeing it in finance, fintech, anywhere where you have an account that is accessible. Uh, these bad actors are going after them, unfortunately. And it's huge effect across the board, not just financially, but if you think about it on the, from the customer side, it's not just like someone took your credit card. They, got a, you know, they stole your credit card. Something as simple as that, a piece of plastic. Um, they're stealing you. In a way, um, they have access to something that you feel is safe and secure and private. Um, and it really, really affects the customers in a negative light outside of just financially. Um, and what, what you're seeing is a lot of drop off because of it. And an ATO happens on an account and they're, they're abandoning their service provider, whoever the account belong or whatever service the account was on, uh, they're, they're just abandoning it. They're scared. So they'll move on to someone else. And there's a lot of options out there. So if you can protect yourself and protect your customer, then, then you'll have someone who'll stay with you. Absolutely. Sandeep, do you want to throw anything in there? 
yeah so i think sean has uh, shared very well information and i think to substantiate it i would i would say to prove the evidence i had done some sort of a research by reading some of the reports right uh, like sean has mentioned it's it's in, it's increased the the people are using a digital online goods uh, they are trying to make online shopping they are booking uh, on movie tickets uh, whatever it is not right so if you look at your morning schedule to evening schedule you are doing a lot of online activity and we are using our mobile handset uh, laptop devices various other devices you know to do a lot of activities and this is where you know uh, this is this is very lucrative to fraudster or cyber criminal or even hackers right and hence i think i i think this is why the numbers are increasing like you you can see now you know billions of personal record has been exposed data breaches has become so frequent you know and people now getting used to it if tomorrow some some company is releasing and saying that hey we got to be released uh, with new data breach so people are now saying yeah it's now regular news my data is already there on internet but if you look at the other side of coin you know uh, because of this what is happening the fraudster or attacker has now to spend very few amount to run the any fraud attack as it's readily available in your dark market anyone can access your record and eventually run very smooth attack to to make a very nice fraud uh, right and uh, and hence i think uh, the numbers are saying here 18 billions of sensitive information is leaked till january 2020 and i think i was reading news last week or i would say last to last day where two more billion records are going to be added so we can say it's a 20 billion record sensitive record has been uh, leaked right so this is what i feel as of now about sensitive sens- sensitive data absolutely and and to the to both you guys's points it's important for everybody to understand that from the from the bottom up this is affecting everybody right we have the yes. the consumers that are whose data is being leaked whether it's login credentials or uh, as you had said personal identifiable information you know they're they're what what fraudsters call profile information um yeah. not only are the login credentials being used to commit ATOs but we also have you know profiles being built out uh to go create these ATOs and then you know uh commit third party ATOs or what was the term that you used Sean pre pre account takeover is that what you had said yeah i believe that's what the term is for it uh, i've also yeah. pre hijacking yeah pre hijacking yeah uh, the the point is that all of this information is being leveraged in many different ways and it's secondarily affecting uh, everybody from the from the bottom up you have accounts that are being uh, taken over with merchants with stored stored values and things like that uh, you have financial institutions fintechs the line goes up uh, everybody's being affected by these ATOs so this um great job articulating uh why these things are becoming prevalent and why these things are such a big deal and who it affects um with that sandeep go ahead let's uh let's see True. what information you got for us so i think you know i just want to extend this topic now even we are obsessed with reusing the password right i can remember myself i mean, i'm i'm not out of this uh, people right so even i used uh, my password with multiple accounts and uh, when when i saw some of the services are online where i can share my where where i can check my passwords right if if it is got breached or not and there i found my lot of same passwords has been used in multiple services and it's 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 been completely uh, spread across the different services so from that time you know uh, because we are a cyber aware probably uh, now we have a lot of randomness but you know there are a lot of people who who are still obsessed uh, using same password on every different services right and hence i think you know uh, even i agree with this number saying that 50% of single password been used on various different services or various different accounts eventually Uh, right from your social uh, accounts or maybe your e-commerce account or retail account or maybe your banking password or maybe your crypto wallet password uh, whatever it is right so people are obsessed and i can see that uh, because of this 50% number uh, the fraudster may get more confidence on a leaked data where they can just try to reuse the same password on various different services of these stats here that that we've seen 
The one that surprised me the most was the 60% of scamming victims not changing their passwords. Right. Like a, a, after that happens, you know, like I understand the need for normalcy and wanting to stick to something that's familiar that you can remember, but not changing it whatsoever after you've been a victim. That one actually really surprised me. True. Yeah, True. Absolutely. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah. Oh yeah. I just wanted to really reinforce the idea that like, uh, if somebody hears about a, a breach that happened with, you know, like a digital service provider, right? Like a like a streaming service. I don't want to name anybody. If someone if something happens with a streaming provider, uh, and that same email password combination is being used, you know, with their bank account, with their, you know, whatever account that has much higher value, very important for the, the general public to, to one, use different passwords for your different platforms. That's, that's, that's the first idea. Secondarily, um, if something happens with your password combination, you're, it's not only that, that platform that's at risk, understand wherever else you use that combination is, is also going to be affected. Um, so yeah, that was a great point to bring up. And there's password right. managers to try and help you balance all of that too, because there's so many services now. And, you know, especially with the pandemic and everything that happened and everyone being pushed online here, you know, you have an account for this an account for that, like so many accounts now um, that it becomes really hard to manage having a different password for every single one. And even if you do not falling into the trap of a pattern, you know, cause fraudsters yeah. will rotate through those patterns. So if you have like True. a keyword, and then one, two, three, you know, if they sc scroll through those, they're going to have that as well. You know, like, you know, Jim, one, two, three, Jim, one, two, three, four. You know, there's a good chance that that could be figured out as well. It's not that difficult. Yeah. Yeah. But Sean, you know, uh, I feel that password managers is again, new attack surface for a fraudster or attacker. Uh, you must be heard of last week itself. One of the password manager, it got itself breached. And, uh, yes. You know, I feel that that's additional attack surface for any cyber criminal if we if we try to use such managers as well. But, you know, I think at some certain extent, there are a lot of offline password managers also available to, to manage your overall password management. Yeah, sure. Right. And I think, you know, uh, just because of all these number, definitely almost from the reports, I can see 87% of businesses are now suffering from very high frauds right uh, and you know when i was talking with a lot of our uh, customers or even i was looking uh, after onboarding them we are going to discuss a lot of uh, statistics about that also but yeah we are able to see at least uh, high fraud losses uh, although there are substantial way to calculate but yes uh, uh, I would say 87% makes sense here looking at the current, uh, all the statistics. Yeah, that's not a surprising number. So let's dive into that a little bit so that we know um, for any merchants who are on the call or, or view this in the future, um, when we talk about the suffered losses, it's going to be more than just, you know, chargebacks for unauthorized purchases. It's going to be more than, than, than the typical fraud is going to, to be there, as Sean, you had mentioned. Let's drill down on that a little bit. Um, if someone were to be approaching their ATO problem, where would they look for evidence of, of, of a direct ATO attack against their operation? Depends. Do you want to catch them pre or post order? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> no, there, 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 there's a lot of indicators out there that you can use. Um, you know, as, as this is going to explain, you know, session data is extremely valuable. You know, how are they using the site? What are they doing that's different? Um, those are really key indicators that you can pick up. Uh, one thing that I've always expressed when it comes to account takeovers is new, right? New is the key, new activity, yeah. you know, new device, new ATO, or sorry, ATO, <laughs> new device, <laughs> uh, new IP, new, d new address, you know, did they change the phone number? You know, how are they traversing the website? Is it different than the customer gen usually does? Um, there's all sorts of indicators that you can pick up and I'm sure Sandeep has some good insights into yeah. this one. Yeah, definitely. So I think um, I just want to move to the next uh, where, uh, where, we're, where we're talking about a uh, lot of enterprise companies or maybe a small company or maybe a startup company, VC funded companies. 
the numbers are talking very loud here so almost around 343 billion dollars which is a cumulative merchant loss to all online payment fraud and it's a globally between 2023 to 2027 so almost like a five years down the line and believe me i think it's a uh, almost uh, 350% mac 350% of apple's revenue you know uh, like last time they have released uh, some revenue and over and above this 343 billion dollar just fraud so like it's a very massive extensive loss i believe and so i assume that this 343 billion dollar projection comes from the the amalgamation of all different types of frauds so the transaction yes. fraud atos identity theft all Correct. these things okay all these things yeah when yeah. i first saw that that metric that was that's staggering to think right and to see the hockey stick that we've seen over the last few years where it's it's a gradual increase and then it just skyrocketed over the last couple of years uh, it's just shocking you know, we definitely need to do what we can to get a, ho a hand on this uh, with the areas that we have influence over. Yeah, that's shocking. True. True. So, and, and you know, I think, uh, like you already mentioned, it's not just with one fraud. Uh, it's, it's amalgamation of a lot of other frauds. But if you try to make top two or top three, I think account takeover takes one of, one of the place there as well. And the rest of the other frauds specifically in payment and transactional frauds right yeah i totally agree with you and it, and it further reinforces what your point was earlier where you had mentioned that it's an easy way forward you know for, for yeah. an operation that is unprepared against these attacks getting a hold of breached information going in, in and hijacking an account is is relatively a straightforward a uh, way to you know commit fraud it's a method that's that's relatively easy for people that are accessing this inf information on the dark web or whatever um and that makes total sense that that atos have, have skyrocketed the way that they are yeah true yeah, and you don't even have to look at the dark web to get credentials <laughs> any longer right like everything's yeah. led onto the surface web you know you see the groups and listings and telegram you see other like online marketplaces that have them up for sale, the little shops set up selling credentials. Now I'm not going to yeah. drop any of the site names in this discussion, but they're very easy to see and find for anybody who wants to just go through Google. Yeah. It's a simple Google ninja technique. Right. <laughs> right. So now I think uh, what, I want to also focus on what are the impact probably the ATO is putting in the market, right? Uh, like I tried to divide into the multiple points and I think point B and E will be the almost same where we are talking about customer experience. But let's begin with point number A, uh, where it talks about sailing of, uh, like it's talk about the credential stuffing attack where uh, the most of the uh, roster are using credential stuffing attack or brute force attack to gain access to the network or to gain access to the account, I, I would say. But you know, before that, the dark web, just like Sean mentioned, right? Telegram, dark web, they're all selling PII information or credential information. Uh, and while selling this information, you know, they also sell the credit card details. So, but uh, the differentiating point I'm seeing here, the PII data will be always as valuable as even if it used two time, three time, four time. But when we, uh, when I say, when the fraudster is trying to sell the credit card, it, it might have a value of only one time because once the credit card has been used, probably the owner is going to block it or someone is going to block it, right? And uh, hence the credit card value get reduced in the dark web, but the PII information always will be used for various other purpose. And it's always going to give a return money back to the fraudster or attacker, right? And hence, I think uh, almost, uh, I would say billions of accounts of credential will be used for uh, performing various different attacks, including the credential stuffing and, and the brute force. Yeah, absolutely. Information holds value, right? It doesn't have to just be the simple fact that your credit card's on there or you know you may have some credits or something. You've got your personal information. They can get your name, your address, your phone number a lot of key details that they need to start building these identities elsewhere. You know, they don't have to right. start with, with your account. They can move on and create their own uh, somewhere else Ooh. for some other means that always holds value. 
Um, and especially once it's confirmed, you know, if it conf is confirmed as legitimate, then that adds even more value to that information. True. Absolutely. And that's one thing that I've drilled down on in a, in, the, in a bunch of pieces that I've done is the manipulation of PII. And, and it's, I feel that the, the most overlooked point is that a set of what, what a fraudster calls profile information is, uh, is manipulated over some time, whether that's you know a few weeks or a month or maybe a few months if it's a really high value profile. Um, and then not only that, not only is the work being applied against one profile, but it's also being applied against 10, 15, 20 profiles at any given time, um, at least in what I've experienced. Um, and all of the use cases, the, in, the use cases for uh, the profile information, the PII is just infinite. Right. Uh, establishing yeah. credit cards, establishing lines of credit, establishing accounts for mule accounts, checks, IDs, the, the 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 list goes on and on. And of which ATOs seems to be a very, very effective through line for anybody dealing with, uh, you know, compromised PII and profile information. So, yeah, definitely, True. definitely resonates. True. Right. So, like, if, if you look at the point number B, you know, I believe uh, most of the businesses, whenever I try to visit e-commerce website or retail website or even payment or banking, I believe every businesses consider every customer as a criminal because they add a lot of friction, right? So, we have to validate our devices or maybe we need to validate uh, via outbound method that's SMS, OTP or even on email verification or personal identity verification. And they add a lot of friction on various different touch points, right from, I would say, registration or login or even updating some sort of profile. And hence, you know, because of all this friction, every user get frustrated and the customer experience is completely suffered, you know, and and I think I believe uh, when I was talking with our other product manager, customer experience is already linked to your revenue as well. So I can see that here, uh, two out of three online customers walk away from the digital businesses, right? And hence the revenue loss is filed. Although this is going to be a subjective, we, will, we might not able to uh, calculate how much loss we were able to see through this uh, customer friction. Uh, just because of, uh, just because of, uh, for the sake of some sort of security, you know, and, and, you know, even if some sort of account takeover attack happens, uh, you might not able to get back that customers because the customer got to know that my account is keep getting locked or my account has been hijacked on this service. Probably I don't want to come back and use the same service because there are a lot of alternatives also available on the internet. Yeah, absolutely. Not only is there the loss in, you know, possible chargebacks that are coming, but there's also the loss of trust, which leads to financial losses because how, how could you possibly predict? I mean, there's averages, don't get me wrong, but how could you accurately predict what the lifetime value of a customer is and when they've lost Correct. faith in your platform uh, as, as a result of a breach or as a result of their account being hijacked, right? This, so this touches on, right. on many points throughout the marketplace that are kind of, uh, redundant, right? We have the, the first, the source of the data being breached, which of course causes loss in faith. Then we have the accounts being, uh, uh, taken over the ATO is actually happening on a profile on a, on a platform and the, the customer who owns the account losing faith in the platform. And then we have the transactions on the back end of that. And then we have the chargebacks on the back, back side of that. There's, there's a lot to consider um, uh, that, that, that ha where the effects are being measured. So those are great points. Absolutely. Yeah, and Sandeep, you mentioned the customer experience. And yeah. it, fr from what, I, what I've noticed uh, working on ATOs, um, speaking to other providers and whatnot, is the simple fact that the communication is just not there to adequately put that customer at ease and get that trust back in your co company. It's not necessarily always the friction factor that pushes them away from your securities and everything like that that you've put into place um, to protect them, but it's also the way that you deal with things after the fact. Um, it, it's still new to a lot of custom companies to have to deal with the customers at such scale like this. Um, so there's not that time 
for the communication that there used to be. And, you know, simple things like, for example, macros could are created right. oftentimes to communicate. There's not that personal aspect. These people are scared. And unfortunately, without that personal touch, it's really hard to bring them back. Yeah, true. True. I think once once gone, then every all the time it's gone. Yeah, great points. Yeah. So I think let's move on to the point number C here. So point number C, again, like Sean uh, was uh, talking about initially the account takeovers, right? Uh, I believe account takeover is not limited to any industry here. If your platform or your business dealing with PI information or sensitive information, which has alignment with your monetary, then probably you are the one of the target for a fraudster, right? And uh, here, here you need to understand uh, you're going to be always a fraudster or attacker's favorite uh, place because a lot of data you're going to save in your platform. I know there are some of the platform which stores a lot of server credentials. So once the account is breached, uh, the server credential is also breached, right? So these kind of platforms or even your e-commerce platform is going to contribute a huge uh, uh, to the account takeover. And I think 43% of all uh, frauds happens via at ATO also, ATO method using. And I think uh, most of the uh, businesses, specifically the digital businesses in 2022, these businesses, I think, becoming a very lucrative for a fraudster. Absolutely. And then thinking about the global network uh, that that is collaborating for these things you have the first hand the data breaches are being perpetrated by the cyber criminals that the quote unquote hackers right the black hats out there who are being yeah. uh you know who are working with fraudsters who then leverage the the data uh the collaboration of the network is really what's what in my uh, what i ass assert is that this collaboration is really driving home uh this widespread presence of data breaches and then secondary um the atos and identity theft that that's that's coming from it um and to think that it's 43 percent of all frauds reporting to oh well according to either visa experian or gardner uh is yeah. just insane 43 percent is is in this not new but this definitely <laughs> growing right epidemic of 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 a fraud method um and it makes sense and it's it's definitely something Something scary to think about. <laughs> well, to me, they seem to have discovered the value in doing this as opposed to some of the other fraud methods that we were seeing before. They, they've discovered that there is absolute value in doing this. It's easy and they can do it at scale. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I think point number D and E, we already covered uh, in the previous slide and also while discussing point number C. So I think it makes sense to move on to the next slide. Okay. So here I think uh, uh, you're able to see some OTSIF data statistics here. Uh, the orange lines uh, depicts about failed authentication and the blue line shows the successful authentication. This is overall about uh, our customers, uh, which they face a lot of failed attempts. Sometimes they face successful authentication as well, right? But uh, in May, you can see there is a spike. And also in July, you can see there is a spike. So there are a lot of interesting facts there. Uh, and I think uh, we can discuss more in detail. Uh, when we talk about this failed uh, login, you know, there are various reasons uh, behind that. Probably there are going to be automated attacks. Uh, there might be some credential stuffing attack. And there are various other uh, robotic mouse movement attack, uh, including which makes authentication basically. And uh, hence, uh, there are a lot of uh, failed attempts happen. But I want to put one case here. The chart that you were looking is at a global web hosting business, you know, and uh, this is specifically for one customer. And, and this business specifically, if you look at, uh, they were facing a credential stuffing attack almost around nearly, I would say 50,000 plus a day uh and attacker was trying to get into the accounts and steal sensitive server configuration files because most of the web hosting businesses on a billing platform they store their 
their customers server authentication or server credential uh, just because they have purchased some sort of services web hosting services right and i think uh, foster deploy deployed readily available credential stuffing tool and also they were bypassing the existing client side validation on the form right and additionally i think if i am able to recall uh, they were also using uh, local ip addresses so when i say local ip addresses that means local city ip addresses so let's say a lot of ip addresses from new york or maybe are from berlin from germany right and uh, to evade a uh, lot of different uh, protections on uh, if you are using any sort of fraud platform where you can see if the ip addresses are coming from residential and additionally from one city probably uh, people will think like this is everything is normal right so nothing is happening much here in this case sure uh, let's just take a scenario here right <clears throat> so maybe i'll just use sean name uh, just to imagine <laughs> there is nothing related to sean here so sean is a security uh, engineer right so here our sean is fraud uh, fraud analyst but our sean is in security and uh, security engineer he he is walking into the office and i think uh, probably uh, everything looks normal and uh, he was sitting on desk the network traffic looks good uh there is no sim solution alerts everything is going very fine uh, but when he was walking through the customer support everyone is too busy he was hearing my password has been changed uh, i'm not able to access my uh, account account has been locked out and sean the security engineer he realized what is happening i my people were like they were like mostly busy in talking some other stuff but they are not talking about passwords account lockouts and all of this and this is where he rushed to his desk and uh, and he start looking into all this logs and, and he finds nothing uh, then probably you know uh, he was started looking into our dashboard if he has installed uh, and this is where he figured out there are ip addresses uh, which is making request to the login and there are a lot of login request has been happened and they were one ip address is, is responsible with the hundreds of uh, user agents thousands of user agents right and this is where he figured out yes uh, this seems to be a some sort of a spike into the failed attempts and someone is trying to lock out the accounts or someone is trying to get into the account or maybe this company has been breached and the database is in public right and and because of this you know uh, the detection happened quickly and uh, they were tried to reduce uh, the all sort of uh, failed attempt or credential stuffing attack they have mitigated properly mm -hmm. but there are a lot of successful attempt you can see in blue line once the attempt happened for a failed then suddenly the successful attempt also increased and for even uh, june and july also there is a some good amount of successful authentication was happening but uh, here they were using authsif and a lot of authentication had a challenges where they had to uh, prove themselves like if, if you are a good user or bad user right and hence uh, we were able to figure out using various behavior, different fingerprinting behavior ip addresses threat level and we were also using a lot of signals which helped us to figure out whether this is a credential stuffing attack or not right and successfully mitigated and and we have been able to deny the access and this is where uh, shawn the engineer security engineer got a call from ciso and this is where he mentioned the now the attack at least somewhere it has been mitigated that's awesome and when you first brought up this slide when we were when we were having our early discussions the thing that really popped out to me was um how this expands the use cases of where we see these attacks and and what immediately came to mind for me is is as you mentioned this was a a, a hosting platform right a, a website yeah. hosting uh, company right where this attack yeah. has been identified with that think about what websites are being you know hijacked so this would be we we typically isolate the data breaches to be happening at at x platform and then those credentials being accessed by the customers well in this particular yeah. use case uh, into the accounts of the customers, I should say. In this particular yeah. use case, the customer is then again another merchant or another holder of data. So this creates this cyclic or cyclic um, like evolution of ATOs because 
not yeah. only were there data breaches, you know, of the credentials or whatever from from different platforms, but in addition to that, now this ATO attack in this particular use case also opens the door to to fraudsters for the potential to access more sets of information by accessing these different websites and going through whatever data they might or might not have stored at different touch points, which if you consider that, that's going to open up mom and pop shops all the way up to, I mean, everyone uses hosting. So like everybody yeah. who has a website, um, you know, people, there's, there's only a limited number of, of hosting services out there. There, there are a lot, but there's still a limited number. Um, when you consider that on one server you might have everybody ranging from the pizza shop on the corner all the way up to you know a Walmart, you know what I'm saying? The potential there yeah. is very, very, very uh, powerful, right? To imagine that, yeah. and so by analyzing all these different data points and and putting processes in place, as you see there, uh, that identifies just super powerful. Um, but yeah, that's one thing I thought was really interesting is just these attacks highlight attacking using ATOs to then further attack new platforms, uh, which then can lead to data breaches. I thought that was that was an interesting spin on the on the on the landscape. Yeah. Yeah, and Sand so, Sandeep, you mentioned something that resonates with me as well, although it's not really completely illustrated in this chart. Um, you mentioned the spike in successful logins. Yeah. Right? Just because an attack has happened and you see all the failures doesn't mean that those successes aren't later on used. For, for example, there's oftentimes where there is the initial infiltration attack, where they're running through that list of breached credentials, just trying to find out which ones work and which don't. They're just yeah. testing. So then following that, you're going to have that secondary attack where they're just going through that successful list, whether it's the fraudsters, the original group themselves, you know, now they have that shorter list. So when they actually go to use and access these accounts, it's safer for them to go undetected because the IPs are now hitting um, successful login attempts as opposed to failed ones, or they've sold the accounts for a higher value than what they originally purchased them for because they're now selling a list of accounts that they know, hey, these ones work. Yeah, yeah I think uh, uh, that's a very interesting case. So if you are trying to sell any, uh, or I say the fraudsters try to sell any raw information, probably they will do the first initial job for them and 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 increase the value of the entire data set, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. If I have a list of a million accounts, you know, I can only sell them for X amount because I don't know if they work or not. If I then run them and then condense that list down to twenty thousand accounts. For those 20,000 successful logins, where I could even go to have a look at what information is available first, I can then inflate the value of those for my sale and make some profit. True. Absolutely. The monetization of the data itself. That's a, so that's another evolution that feeds into this is getting the data firsthand, logging into the account, and then taking then changing the course to sell the information yet again, to resell it at a higher value, because now you've stress tested it, now you've tested it, now you've confirmed that it gives you the access that it claimed to at the beginning. Very, yeah, that's a very good thought. Yeah, yeah. so w whether it is a sale, or it's the original group using a successful list that they've generated from that initial infiltration, infiltration that next attack you'll see from that group or whoever has those credentials, will be a spike in your successful logins. However, they will have that common attribute that does connect them together, whether it be IP address, uh, user agent combination, whatever the case may be, you will see that spike of successful upon those details. Yeah, true. I think just to time check here, uh, Alex, I think it's uh, almost 30 minutes has been done. If you have any questions from audience uh, to take up, or else we can move on to the next. Uh, the only question I had was from Gabrielle, who asked if we're going to share the conference video, which I assume she means after the fact. So uh, yeah. for that, the answer is yes, but it, it's just uh, technical questions at this point. Okay. So now coming to the actual methods, right? Uh, and this is going to be uh, fun to discuss because when we talk about methods probably uh, the methods has a lot of bypasses also right and there are various ways to execute uh, such methods so i just want to pick up uh, the first one is credential stuffing attack here uh, 
I think a lot of people uh, get confused with point number one and two, right? So many people feel uh, credential stuffing is 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 a similar version of brute force. So I don't believe that first, uh, and it's pretty plain because credential stuffing attack where you will just try to use one username and one password from the breach database and test it if it works or not, and then move on to the next one. And this has to be automated because Frostr don't have a patience, I believe so, because they want to just execute millions of data uh, on a platform or on e-commerce or any merchant website, right? And hence, I think uh, credential stuffing ha happens. But if you go deep dive and do the complex version of uh, credential stuffing, uh, Froster, I believe they try to use, or I, I seen on our platform also, uh, they are using local IP addresses, residential IP addresses to make it believe like it's a real authentication happening. They also try to add a lot of, I would say, time gap between two authentications so that uh, any fraud engine probably it will see into the different way, right? Because there are residential IP addresses. Also, there is a time gap, but there is a pattern for every uh, authentication. And once this successfully happens, uh, they just try to keep that as a successful authentication and further they will use it for login or using the account uh, for the next next use, right? Yeah, that's a good way to, to, to clarify the difference. Um... Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. So difference, powerful. I think, uh, and on a brute force, you know, uh, it's more like guessing the password or or it's more like a just figuring out uh, if the user is using some sort of combination. And, but this get into the trouble because uh, when I was talking with our, one of our customer who, who is into the FinTech, I believe their 60% of password has been locked because they have a password policy of after three attempts, the user will get locked. So you can just uh, think about there are millions of users and 60% has been locked uh, just because someone has tried brute force attack or password spray. Uh, you can just think about how stressful time would be that. Almost a week, uh, these guys has been spent to just to reduce total number of tickets or just to get the tick accounts back, uh, back in running, mm. right? Or they also had to run through a lot of backend queries with the permissions, right? And I think uh, this is the biggest difference uh, I, I see in the credential stuffing attack and brute force attack. And if you if you look at credential stuffing attack execution, uh, it's more like a lot of open source tools are available for performing credential stuffing attack. You can do the combination. Uh, there, are, there, are, there is a username password and you can also change for every request user agent you can also change the ip address right and there are a lot of genuine or i would say uh, the ua which is very well known when i say ua it's a user agent so very well known and and these frauds will try to run where in a very systematic way to execute all the request right and and eventually uh, they figure out that the pattern is changing and and probably they're having some sort of good success. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that, that was very well said, honestly. And the velocity that they're able to change things at now, you know, they control they can control that. Yeah. Um, it, it's amazing the amount of how micro they can get with these details and the alterations to what what they can what they're pushing through to your system. Uh, it makes it a lot more difficult to spot the patterns and what's going on um, but eventually you know there comes a point where you can see them um, yeah. and therefore you can attack the attackers true and that's the beauty of credential stuffing uh, the pattern will be uh, seen on the platform or or i would say if you're just doing a log analysis the brute force and credential stuffing definitely that will show you some sort of patterns for sure yeah. it's just a matter of identifying it Yep. And for running this credential stuffing attack, you know, uh, it doesn't even require huge cost. As you know, that there are a lot of proxy uh, are available. And somehow, if you're not running with the, any fraud engine, probably uh, uh, you are going to, uh, I mean, all of these IP addresses basically will, will not be able to detect because there is no fraud engine or no one is looking for the IP threat level. 
right? And hence, uh, the credential stuffing may, may get be successful. Yeah, great points on on all on on both fronts. Uh, yeah, so is it fair to say that these are the for everybody listening that these are the primary ways that ATOs are are being uh, attempted is through credential stuffing and br brute force attacks because that's how I feel. Yeah, and that's okay. the easiest way I believe. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So now point number three, I think, uh, Alex, I think you can put more on this uh, phishing attacks. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of phishing different attacks uh, happening. And I think on our platform, what we are looking into the reference, referral header, I would say. So if someone is trying to fish your login, then it has to come that URL in your referral header. And uh, thanks to browser security, I think uh, we will get to know all the referrals. And based on the referral ana analysis, you know, uh, the phishing URLs will be detected. And eventually on the login page itself, uh, we can elevate immediate risk. Uh, when we say phishing and social engineering, right, these are, I would say, uh, brothers and sisters. Yeah. Uh, this can be run into the many different combination. Uh, like Alex, maybe uh, you can talk up more about social engineering and phishing here. Absolutely. Uh, so when it comes to phishing attacks, social engineering, and targeted account takeover, um, those are three things that that I can definitely speak to. And I think that it's it's important to understand that all three of those attacks happen uh, happen with everybody that we l listed before. You know, you, it's important to consider that when we when we talk about a hijacked or a taken over account, an, an account that has been uh, hijacked, um, we're not only talking about the consumer. We're not only talking about B2C. We're talking about B2B. And as you showed in your slides, we're also talking about that. Um, and yeah. how phishing attacks, targeted account takeovers, and social engineering are all also being employed uh, in order to start the process with data breaches and things like this. Uh, there was a platform just a few weeks ago, of course, we're not going to name them, um, that was compromised through an internal uh, social engineering attack that then led to unauthorized logging in and, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the, the variations on the ways that these can, can take place are just insane. Any, any, so when it comes to the phishing attacks, it is relatively straightforward. Get someone to interact with a thing that you sent them, whether it's a text message, a phone call, a email, whatever it is. Click a link, go to a place, type some stuff in, and I'm the fraudster is going to monitor and record that the inputs, and then go use it with the with the established account. You know, there. Um, that's typical for phishing. When it comes to targeted account takeover, this is something that I that I have intimate experience with and um <laughs> and, th and that's all based on like as w as we've mentioned it's the the aggregation of pii data into what fraudsters call a profile as this profile gets more robust that's when the access to more accounts come into play and and when coupled with a little bit of social engineering with any customer facing agent uh internally with any company uh i personally saw great success with gaining access to different accounts um and then again, to add another dimension to this, there's different levels of ATOs, right? There's different flavors of ATOs. For example, the one that I had just spoken about and we, we spoke about prior to going live is the third party ATOs that, uh, that I brought up yeah. on a call a few weeks ago. Um, by accessing one piece of a financial indist uh, institutions, uh, by accessing one piece of a customer's account with a financial institution, the fraudster can now gain access to the transaction history, which then can be leveraged through micro deposit verification to create another account, you know, at a new platform and then use the initial account as a funding mechanism or as a funding account. The flavors, the combinations, it's, it's, it's ever growing in, in it. And, and now that you've, you've brought to the table, this idea of being cyclic in its, in its ever growing, uh, you know, with the hosting platform you were speaking about, by talking yeah. about leveraging data breach information to get access to something that's that's like a merchant service provider uh, or a website host or whatever it might be, and then using that information to then get information from another platform and then use that information to then spread out 
among all these different platforms where passwords have been have been used over and over the caveats and the iterations of all of these different methods of fraud especially when you combine them uh it just grows and grows and grows and grows so i think that that with those three at least for me um there's probably 20 different channels to go down right and every single yeah. one has different vulnerabilities with different people uh among the the list of people in the marketplace from consumers up to you know the government right right sean it looked like oh, you something. guys are cut you guys are covering this fantastically well <laughs> like, seriously, there, there's not really anything to build off of that you know like there's just you know and a, everything you guys have mentioned has been spot on and you know one of the keys to all this success is just velocity right they're able to do all of these at such scale that they're going to find success unless you have the right protections in place right absolutely and I think the last one that, that, that Sandeep, I'd like to hear what you have to say yeah. about is the application vulnerabilities, because that's something yeah. that I don't have personal experience with. So I'd love to hear your spin on that and, and what data points yeah. come into play in, in that. Yeah, true. So I think um, application security or application vulnerabilities uh, is, is have a very different dimension here. So what we are seeing here, Proxer is trying to attack using available information, right? So let's say PI information or credential information or, or anything which is publicly available. But specifically, if you look at application vulnerabilities, uh, that means you have a password escape feature and uh, authentication feature in order to get into the account, right? Uh, and I think I have seen a lot of vendors and application owners uh, they don't have really very well secured authentication. Uh, folks are using OAuth, which has so many flaws to bypass OAuth authentication. If you just try to search OAuth bypasses on Google, you will see the list of use cases, how to bypass OAuth authentication, mm. or maybe IDP federated authentications, right? There are a lot of many ways. Uh, and also there are a lot of other bypasses where if your application is vulnerable to SQL injection, probably that would be very worst because that's one of the very oldest way. And uh, if, he, if someone is trying to put uh, the SQL injection queries, probably that's again going to get access to the application, right? And there are various ways uh, where a lot of developers do mistake during authentication development. Sometimes they put some default credential also, uh, maybe ACME or default admin password or admin123, something like that, right? So there are a lot of weak, hard-coded password also they have been able to place. So similarly, this is all on authentication uh, module. Similarly, if you look at the password reset mechanism also. So when, when we try to do the reset password, it's supposed to send a link to the email or on your SMS, uh, for a verification code, right? And then only you will be able to change the password if you are an authenticated user. Mm -hmm. But in password reset, there are a lot of flaws. Uh, I can explain one of the flaw here, which is very interesting. Uh, every time when we make request uh, to the password reset feature, there is a header, called, we call it as a host header. And if we change that host header to evil.com, then what will happen? it will send email from authentic server to the user's email. Uh, and there will be one button uh, saying reset password and that you are, and that buttons URL will be changed. will be like evil.com slash whatever the token. And once the user clicks on it, it sends the user, uh, the, the password reset token. And eventually attacker will be able to change the password because he has a valid token. So similarly, there are a lot of password reset bypasses also available in the market. And this is one of the use case where using, uh, by changing host header, probably you can hijack the token of the uh, uh, token of the password reset, right? And hence, once the password has been reset and then yeah, the attacker easily can log in into the system and perform some further uh, task, right? And if you just try to search over the internet account takeover uh, bypass methods, there are a lot of 
uh, use cases are readily available. I would say if your application is not gone through with the extensive penetration testing on specifically on these two models modules, then probably uh, there are high chances that your application is vulnerable for some of the use cases or test cases here. Nice. Well, not nice, but good, <laughs> good information. Yeah. Uh, I, I was unaware of the, the vulnerabilities for password, uh, for authentications. Uh, that's yeah. Okay. Uh, we have four minutes before the top of the hour. Yeah. Okay. Oh, is it? So, yeah. So let's cover, I think, uh, the important topic here. So it's uh, leveraging session data. <laughs> So Great I think build up. Um, lots of information and, and, and covered a lot of ground. How do we stop yeah. it? Now the climax. Yeah. Here we go. Now the climax. True. So, you know, I, I just want to keep this as a very high level because uh, uh, there are a lot of signals that we can discuss and we might need another two hours to just to talk about a lot of signals and how that will affect. Right, Sean? Correct me if I'm wrong here. <laughs> oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Time. Yeah. So, so, so as of now, I will say, uh, if you just see at my screen, you know, there are a couple of uh, very important detectors, or I would say signals is important to understand if your user needs to have a low friction. So consistent browser fingerprinting is one of the fingerprinting uh, mechanism is, is must be there with the consistent way of looking with the consistent way of uh, having in the browser. Uh, the devices must be always recognized on the platform. Uh, behavior within the good norms, we'll discuss in detail uh, in next slide probably, and consistent location and IP threat level has to be normal. Then only, I think, usually uh, every every engine, fraud engine specifically, is, is provides low friction on authentication. Or that may be on various different touch points, but I'm just precisely talking about the authentication here, right? If some things goes wrong, let's say uh, the devices is not really recognized, uh, the user's behavior is not within good norms, or the location is not really the usual location where he is trying to log in, an IP threat level may be increased because he is using a Tor or maybe a, some proxy. Hence, the engine has to increase the high friction, and this is how even OTSEF works. Uh, if if we if we go in more detail, you know. Uh, for a browser fingerprinting, we use browser languages, IP addresses, uh, languages probably which must be same, right? Uh, the screen when it gets changed, right? Uh, a lot of time attacker, they use uh, the screen resolution in a, such a way where the resolution is always very weird, which is not really into the standard. IP addresses, many times it has a thousands of UA. Uh, maybe maybe they're using a kiosk devices where the airport authority uses sometime, right? So there are a lot of unknown uh, things has been used. Uh, many of the time you'll also figure out uh, the within the session data, there are Chrome headless has been used, but there are a lot of ways also to bypass the Chrome headless detection. But we will, we are actually as OTSEF, we managed to figure out how the Chrome headless is working and how people can bypass it, right? And last, not but least, I would say uh, the automated attack using bot and various different softwares makes a lot of session uh, changes immediately, right? Uh, I think this is what I feel uh, is on very high level, I would say. Uh, and, and this is where the differentiating between, right? So in PII data, you need to comply with GDPR, but it, with the session data, you know, uh, there has there is no personal identifiable information using we can easily identify various detections here detections here right uh, this is how i feel so sean if you want to add something else on that on top of it i know that we can discuss more in detail but uh, let's let's do it <laughs> yeah i think we're at the top of the hour <clears throat> but basically ju just to re reiterate you know all this information is fantastic one of these things being off isn't going to be an indicator of an ato you have to have several things that come into play basically I, I look at a three-pronged approach when confirming that something is actually fraudulent so slight deviations here and there are going to confirm it new new is extremely key if all this activity is standard to that customer you know good good chance you might even have a tester on your network you know you want to make sure that this activity all these details connecting to that account are new 
and I'll throw it over to Alex to tie it up. Sorry, that was real brief and not very good, yeah. but we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank you guys so much. We covered so much ground. We really drilled home. Uh, uh, we really drove home the idea of how impactful ATOs are. And with that, speaking about the data points here, uh, I feel the most important thing is to understand um, that there are various ways that ATOs are going to be happening uh, relative to any operation, whether it's a bot attack, credential stuffing, brute force, as you had said, social engineering against uh, customer facing representatives. The flavors are infinite. And yeah. to your point, Sandeep, what you had said uh, regarding the, the difference between leveraging identity information as a verification process and leveraging session data as a verification process. Um, one, one thing that's very beneficial is, is targeting the bots, the bots that might be automated in these attacks. So I think that's a very powerful thing yeah. to bring into play. And then secondarily is yes, you're not operating within PCI GDPR regulations. You've taken it out of those, that world with those restrictions and now it can be applied well, truly against any type or employed for any uh, industry that's out there without limitations. So I think that's awesome. Uh, great points, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, for everybody in the chat, we did get a question. Um, I'll send it straight over to Sandeep after the call, and he'll get in touch with you directly. Uh, Johnny, that cool. was. And then, guys, thank you so much for carving time out of your day to be here. Uh, Sandeep, Sean, it's awesome to have had this chat with you. Thank you for all the great insight. Yeah, we'll, we'll see you guys around. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you everyone. so much. And thanks, yeah, everybody. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Okay. We needed more time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that was that was great. Um, okay. Um we can always do we can always pop into another one, maybe one that's less less formal and more descriptive and conversational and all that stuff. We can always do another one later on. Yeah, because yeah. I feel we yeah. I feel we really laid down